Rikuro is a hardcore VR gamer who loves playing trash games, which are full of glitches and extremely difficult to conquer. After playing many trash games, he has become the most skilled player and comes across the world's best VR game. With over 30 million players in the game, he must use all his expertise as a trash game hunter to conquer the game and become the top player. The story begins with Rikuro defeating a giant boss monster, and the sky gets cleared. The princess, Faria, praises him, but he suddenly jumps into the air, smashing her in the face, and beats the crap out of Faria. The credits roll, and we see he was playing a VR game called Faria Chronicle. Rikuro celebrates his victory, mentioning that Faria was the real menace of this world, and he's glad that he got revenge for everything she put him through. VR games are the most common games now, but there were a ton of games made while the technology was developing, and many turned out to be trash. Although most people despise such games, there are those who only play trash games, and they are called freaks. We learn that Rikuro only likes to play trash games, and is one of those freaks. Rikuro gets some fresh air, feeling like a convict who's finally free after clearing the game, and wonders what he should play next. Later at school, we see a girl practicing how to talk to Rikuro. She waits for him to walk past, but one of his friends gets to him first, and she gets left behind. The scene then cuts to a game shop named Rock Roll, and the owner, Mana Iwamaki, is setting up a poster. The girl from before then comes into the store, and is introduced as second-year high school student, Rei Saiga. Mana tells her that Rikuro isn't there, and Rei gets embarrassed. She tells Mana that she's just there to look at the games and nothing else, but Mana knows her secret and tells her that Rikuro hasn't been there in a while because he's been busy trying to crack an extra special trash game. Mana tells her that he is playing the Feria Chronicle, and it might take him a little longer to crack it. She explains that the game is popular because of its terrible AI, insane enemy attack patterns, and being filled with bugs. It requires serious skills just to beat the first boss, and the final boss fight must be cleared by wearing a mask and shorts. As the two are talking, Rikuro walks into the store, asking if there are any new games for him. Rei immediately hides, and Mana is surprised he already beat the game. He starts telling her about it, and mentions that the princess was the source of all the problems. She would constantly cause chaos, and get his party members killed. If he ever tried to confront her, she just put all the blame on the final boss. If she gets mad, she would just refuse to move, and he would become stuck for hours. Mana is impressed that Rikuro didn't give up, and he mentions that only one thing kept him going, which is the three-minute gap after defeating the final boss and the beginning of the end credits. During that time, he's free to beat the crap out of her without getting into trouble, and thinks it was all worth it in the end. He wonders what he should play next, and Mana suggests that he should try playing a game that isn't trash for once, telling him to try Shangri-La Frontier, also known as SLF, the most popular VR game with over 30 million players. He isn't sure about it at first, but Mana tells him he also needs to experience what a good game is like, and Rikuro decides to check it out. Later, he learns that the game is considered god-tier, and has set a Guinness world record for simultaneous player logins. It's made by the Utopia Entertainment Software Company, which was founded by the genius programmer Tsukuyo Tsukuri, so Rikuro has high hopes for the game. As he enters the game, Rikuro's first task is to create a character and pick a job. He picks the option Twin Blade Mercenary for its flexibility, and chooses Wanderer as his origin, which gives him a bonus to his luck. He starts to customize his character, and is surprised to find so many options. He gets excited, and decides to go hardcore on his character design. Rikuro ends up making his character wear a bird mask so he could hide his face since he's half-naked in this game. He decides to throw away his armor, as it's possible to sell them, and he can make some profit. He names his character Sunraku in every game, which he derived from his original name, and uses the same here. As the gameplay starts, he instantly skips the prologue and jumps straight into play. He finds himself in a forest, 
and is instantly impressed because it feels as if he's moving in real life. He runs and climbs up a tree to test his character's agility, and he can finally feel the difference between a god-tier game and trash game. He uses a map to determine his location, and decides to head to the nearest town. On his way, he checks out his stats, and realizes he has low defense since he has no armor, but hopes his high luck stat will make up for it. Suddenly, he is attacked by a goblin, but he defeats it without breaking a sweat. He levels up, and gets goblin's axe. Just then, he notices something behind the bushes, and a monster bunny suddenly tries to attack him. The attack just misses, and it destroys the tree behind him. Rikuro thinks he would have died if he got hit by the Vorpal Bunny, and the bunny attacks him again, but he manages to block it, and eventually defeats it. He levels up, also getting a flash counter skill, and continues fighting other monsters in the forest. After fighting for over two hours, he manages to obtain two of the bunny swords. He ends up reaching level 12, and he puts most of his points into luck. He realizes he can't level up anymore in this area, so he decides to head over to the second town. He reaches a bridge, which is guarded by a giant python boss. The game suggests that he should fight it with a party of three, but Rikuro charges in. Meanwhile, in the starting town, the people are surprised to see a player wearing high-level knight armor. The player is looking for Sunraku, but can't seem to find anyone with that name, and finds it strange because all new players should start in that town. We then learn that it's Rei, and she's there looking for Rikuro. The scene then cuts to Sunraku facing off against the python boss, and he thinks that first, he will have to check its attack patterns. He dodges while the boss attacks him to analyze its attack patterns, and thinks that its attacks are easy to read. He thinks that it doesn't have any instant kill moves, but he will have to beat it without taking any hits as one hit from it could kill him. When he tries to attack it, his blade gets broken, and he brings out his two special Vorpal Blades, but when he tries to attack, it shoots venom at him. When he checks his status, Sunraka notices that the poison will cause him to lose 1 HP every 10 seconds, and realizes that he only has about 4 minutes to beat the boss. So, he thinks he'll need to rely on his critical hits, as he has learned that in this game, critical hits aren't just random, but are triggered when an attack lands in an ideal way or hits an enemy's weak point. Sunraku thinks that the python's weak point must be its head, but he finds it hard to land a hit on it. He then thinks that he will have to create a weak point of his own, and he uses his screw pierce move on the python boss. This gives the boss a wound, and Sunraku attacks the wound repeatedly, giving him lots of critical hits. He keeps slashing, but is not sure if he can beat it as he doesn't even know how much HP it has. Eventually he manages to land a hit on the boss's eye, and he takes it out. Before he can check out his loot, he realizes he's still taking damage from the poison, so he rushes toward the town to look for an antidote. Meanwhile, at the town, there are two players, Reiji and Mia, who are standing at the entrance of the town. Mia is asking Reiji about taming a monster, and Reiji is glad that he's finally playing the game with his crush after three months of trying. Just then, they see Sunraku running towards them, and Mia gets ready to attack him, thinking he's a monster. Reiji points out that he has a name, so he must be a player. He realizes that Rikuro must have been hit by the boss python's poison. So, he points out the inn where Rikuro can register his respawn point, but he must do it by getting into the bed. Mia praises Reiji for helping out Sunraku, and he thanks Sunraku in his mind, as he got to show off in front of his crush due to him. Sunraku reaches the inn just in time, but the innkeeper starts giving him an intro. He tells her to skip the details, and rushes to his room to register his respawn point. As he makes it to the bed, his HP drops, and his stats are temporarily reduced as a death penalty. Later, we see Sunraku back in the game, and he is in the town called Second Ale. He starts exploring the town, looking for a shop where he can buy maps and recovery items. He thinks about getting a new weapon to replace his twin blades, but he soon realizes that the people are staring at him since he's half-naked. 
The scene then cuts to Sunraku buying the cheapest armor at the armor shop, and we notice that the armor is made from mudfrog skin and grants slash resistance. The shopkeeper tells him that he can make him a better weapon, but he will need to find the materials. Sunraku immediately goes mining in the dire marsh waste, but he becomes frustrated when he only gets two out of the five ores he needed after trying for 30 minutes. A mud frog appears and annoys him as it splashes around, getting mud on him. Sunraku knows that it's resistant to slashing damage since his clothes are made from its skin, so he switches to his goblin axe and takes it out. After a few hours, Sunraku returns to the shop with all the materials for his new weapon. The shopkeeper points out that he found a rare marsh coffin fossil, and it can be used to make a rare dagger. Sunraku likes the idea, and he asks him to make two of these. Later, he checks out his new weapons, and the shopkeeper tells him that he can also upgrade the weapons, so he should come back when he has more materials. Sunraku then thinks that the NPCs in this game are something else, and wonders what kind of AI they use to manage them. The shopkeeper also warns him about the monsters that come out during the night, and suggests that he should get some better armor, but he just thinks it's the perfect chance to test out his new weapons. Meanwhile, Rei defeats the serpent boss with a single slash, and we learn she has searched the entire starting area for Sunraku. She wonders if any new player can defeat the python boss, and decides to look for him in the second town. We then see Sunraku fighting against a redcap goblin, and he struggles against it as it's not like any other goblin that he's fought before. The goblin calls for its friends, and Sunraku becomes surrounded. The goblins lunge at him, but there's suddenly a huge attack that wipes them all out, and a giant wolf monster appears. It's identified as a unique monster called Lycagon the Night Slayer, and Sunraku realizes that there's more to this game than he thought. Meanwhile, we see a computer screen in the UES company, and it shows the progress of dispatching the unique monster at 0%. Later, we see Rei asking Reiji and Mia about their encounter with Sunraku. Mia wants to attack her since she looks scary, but Reiji tells her she's also a player. Reiji describes Sunraku's character to Rei and tells her how he was poisoned, so he ran straight into the town. Rei is impressed by how he was able to beat the boss without even visiting the first town, and gives them an item for their help. She uses her flash ability, and dashes off. Mia is impressed by her speed, and Reiji recognizes the crest on her back as the clan that specifically hunts the unique monster called Lycagon the Night Slayer. He mentions that there are seven unique monsters in the game, and they are called the Seven Colossi. It's unclear when these monsters appear, which led to many of the top players forming clans to hunt them. Mia thinks they are just rare monsters, but Reiji tells her that they are so strong that even after a year of the game being released and with over 30 million players, not a single unique monster has ever been defeated. We then see Sunraku fighting the unique monster, Lycagon the Night Slayer. Lycagon attacks him, but he uses his perfect parry skill to evade its attack. He switches to his Vorpal Blades, and manages to get a few critical hits. Just then the clouds cover the moon, and Lycagon disappears. Lycagon suddenly charges at him, but he dodges all of its attacks. The wolf disappears once again, and Sunraku tries to predict where it will appear from. He manages to land some hits, but realizes that its fur is even tougher than the scales of the python boss. After fighting and landing over 200 critical hits, Sunraku doesn't feel like he has done any damage at all. His weapons are on the verge of breaking, and he thinks it's impossible for him to win, but this just makes him enjoy the game even more. He tries to attack it again, but ends up getting pushed away. Suddenly it starts roaring, and paralyzes Sunraku's body. It disappears once again, and in an instant, Sunraku has his legs cut off. He has 1 HP left, and wonders about how insanely strong the monster is, but thinks its strength is just part of its programming, so there must be a way to defeat it. He decides that instead of clearing the game, he will find a way to defeat it, no matter what it takes. He dies, and receives a curse called Lycagon Mark. 
He respawns at the second ale inn, and finds that due to the curse he's no longer able to equip items on his torso or legs. He thinks he's screwed, and gets angry at Lycagon for doing this. He finds out that due to this curse, monsters who are lower in level than him will flee from him, and conversations with NPCs will also be affected. The curse can be removed by either the prayers of a saint or by defeating Lycagon himself. As he walks through the town, he starts thinking the game is trash due to the curse, but he then remembers the three principles he learned from trash games. The first is a patient mind, the second is an unbreakable spirit, and the third is cool-headed judgment. He checks his status, and finds that from just fighting the unique monster, he was able to level up to 28. He allocates his stat points, but realizes he has completely neglected his vitality stat, so he thinks he's a complete glass cannon, who can die in one hit. With two of his armor slots sealed, he thinks he's doomed. He wishes that his high luck stat would give him good luck, and just then a bunny bounces on his head. The bunny waves at him, so he starts chasing after it. Sunraku thinks it must be some kind of special event where he can get a free item by catching it. The bunny then runs into a dead end, and he makes a gate appear on a wall out of nowhere. The bunny heads inside the gate, and Sunraku finds out that this is a unique scenario named Invitation from Rabatuza. Sunraku remembers reading about this online, that besides the main quest of the game, there are countless side quests, some of which come in the form of unique scenarios, but it's not clear how they are triggered. However, they are said to provide some of the best rewards, and there are even clans which try to hunt for them. Sunraku then enters the door, and we find out that the recommended level for this unique scenario is 80, whereas Sunraku's level is only 28. We then see that he has entered a world filled with rabbits, and the bunny from earlier welcomes him, introducing himself as a mole, and Sunraku is shocked that it can speak. He tells Sunraku that everyone has been talking about him because he took on Lycagon all by himself even though he was so weak, and the marking on his body is proof that the beast acknowledged him. Sunraku wonders if Amul really is an NPC since he talks so much, but he remembers that the curse mark also mentioned that it will affect his speech with the NPCs. Amul starts leading him to meet his boss, and Sunraku worries they might want revenge since he hunted so many Vorpal bunnies in the beginning, but Imol assures him that his boss doesn't take revenge on petty matters. Imol brings him to the rabbit palace, and he tells him that he's the first person to ever visit. Sunraku gets excited hearing this, and he thinks he'll be able to get a unique reward, but starts sweating when he sees the boss. The boss introduces himself as Vaisek, and he is still in fear. As the story continues, we see Rei in the game shop, and she's looking for Rikuro. Mana notices her, and mentions that he is probably immersed in game since it's summer break. She wonders if Ray still hasn't found him, and Ray mentions that he seems to have skipped the first tutorial city entirely. Mana laughs, and thinks that this is typical for a trash game hunter like him. She hopes that Ray can find Rikuro soon, and tell him how she feels, making Ray blush. After that we see Rikuro's sister, Rumi Hizutome, who is heading for work, while Rikuro is checking about Rabatuza. However, the scenario mentioned online is different from what he experienced, and he got to meet with the boss of Rabatuza. He recalls the boss appreciating his Vorpal soul, but Sunraku has no clue what he's referring to. He thinks that this is a special training quest, and refers to the boss as his big brother. This made the boss happy, and he asked him to address the boss as Vash from now on. He puts him in Amol's care, and puts a Vorpal Soul Collar on him which will half his experience points that he receives, but he will gain twice the stat points, and he can't take it off unless Vash allows it. Back in the present, Sunraku thinks that this may not be a bad deal, and realizes that no one in the online forum knows about Vash, which means that no one has found this unique scenario yet. After that, he notices the time, and thinks that it's time for his appointment. We then find out that one of Rikuro's friends invited him for a one-on-one -on -one match in a trash game called Berserk Online Passion, also called BOP for short. The player base of this game has dropped to less than 100 sign-ins per day, 
and the only people who remain are the ones who know each other, and they are all trash game lovers. Sunraku then meets his friend, Motor Katso in the game, and he challenges Sunraku to a match. Katso states that anything goes, in this match, and extends his arms to attack. Sunraku thinks that this is a new glitch that Katso has found, and Katso mentions that he developed it when Sunraku was focused on Faria. Sunraku then uses his quick draw fist to counter Katso's attack, and mentions that he can even counter attacks of a boss with this skill. The other players notice Katso and Sunraku fighting, and think that it's a top tier match. Katso then uses an after image fist attack, and defeats Sunraku. Sunraku is surprised by this attack, and is glad to experience a PvP trash game match. Katso mentions that he's surprised that Sunraku is now playing SLF. Sunraku tells him about the game, and his defeat by one of the seven colossi that made him interested in the game. Katso also thinks about playing SLF after hearing about it from Sunraku, also none of his other friends are playing this trash game. He mentions that he has sent an email about Sunraku playing SLF to a special person, and we see a girl receiving the mail about Sunraku playing SLF. She is fighting some players, and kills them all. Her player name is Arthur Pensilgan, and earns the title player kill. Later, we see Sunraku returning to Second Ale using a teleportation gate made by a mole. He mentions that he needs to get to the city called Thirdrima, and explains that this place will soon get crowded. This means there will be lots of fights over monster and mining spots. So, Sunraku would like to play the unique scenarios in a big city with plenty of breathing room. Imul, being an NPC, doesn't understand most of this stuff, but tells him that she will help him out to the next city, and sends him a request to party up. Sunraku is surprised to learn that he can have NPCs in his party, and he accepts the request. He notices that Imul's stats are mostly better than his, and the only area where he has the slightest edge is his speed. He thinks that Lycagon's mark is the trigger for this unique scenario, and wonders if Imul is the game's way of making it up to him. Just then two girls see Sunraku with Imul, and wonder where he got that cute rabbit. Sunraku then thinks that he would like to keep the information about Imul a secret until he clears this unique scenario, and runs away by telling the girls that it was a ventriloquist act. One of the girls then takes a screenshot of Sunraku with Imul, and mentions that they should ask about this in the forums. Sunraku and Imul reach outside the town, and Sunraku thinks about one of the conditions of the curse where lower level monsters will flee when they see him. Just then, a monster comes running towards them, but after seeing the Lycagon's mark, it starts running away. Sunraku chases after the monster, and uses its vorpal blades to take it down. Sunraku is glad that he can still take out monsters even with the mark, and then decides to head towards the area boss. We then see them in a swamp, but he can't see the boss anywhere. Imul explains that the boss of this area is a monster named Mud Digger, and suddenly she senses his presence. Just then, the Mud Digger appears from the swamp, and it's ready for battle. Sunraku realizes that the swamp forces players into walking state, and due to this his mobility is greatly affected. The Mud Digger boss dives into the swamp and tries to attack them, but Sunraku dodges the attack using his slide move skill. The boss then attacks them again, and Sunraku uses his repel counter move to block its attack. Since Sunraku's attacks have a cooldown time, he wonders how he will counter its next attack, but as the boss attacks again, Imul uses his skill called Magic Edge to attack the boss. Sunraku is surprised to learn that Imul can use magic, and feels grateful that he got another chance. He then tries to close the distance between him and the monster to launch an attack, but this takes a lot of time due to the swamp slowing him down. The monster recovers, and tries to attack him again. Sunraku then uses an evolved form of his screw pierce move, called Spiral Edge, and attacks the boss. He climbs on top of the boss, and asks Imul to use her magic attack again. After Sunraku attacks the boss with his repel counter move, Imul uses her boosted magic to attack the boss, which makes it fall down. 
Sunraku thinks it's over, but they can't seem to see the boss anywhere. Just then, the place starts to shake, and Sunraku can't seem to move. He immediately throws Imul away to protect her from the attack, and gets tossed up high in the air by the boss. He realizes that the boss is trying to kill him through falling damage, but he's unable to do anything. He thinks that this is the end for him, but Imul uses a teleport magic to land his fall on top of the boss. The boss gets defeated, and Sunraku survives barely with 1 HP left. He levels up, and thanks Imul for her support. We then cut to Sunraku and Imul heading to Thirdrima, and Sunraku shoves down all the herbs which increases his HP to 17. He then wonders about Imul's strength, and thinks about using her as mascot until he reaches her level. Imul mentions that they are about to reach Thirdrima, and is excited about Sunraku spending his full time in Rabatuza for training. Sunraku wonders about hiding Imul as they don't want to draw attention like last time, and Imul tells him about using her bracelet. She asks to keep this a secret between them, and transforms into a hot bunny girl. Sunraku is shocked, and thinks that this is starting to look like a harem game. Just then, Imul switches back to her rabbit form, and mentions that maintaining that form is exhausting. She tells him that she can only keep that form for about 5 minutes, and she will transform once they are near the town. After that, they reach the town, and the guards stop Sunraku for being half-naked. Imul explains about his encounter with Lycagon, but in an overdramatic way, and the guards agree to let them in, while some other players are looking at him suspiciously. As they try to enter, a girl called Animalia stops him. The scene cuts to several hours back in the past, where we then learn that the girl who took Sunraku's photo with Imul had uploaded it to the forum, and this has caused a viral discussion in the forum. Animalia sees the message, and thinks that the game only allows them to tame packs of dogs and cats, and wonders if this is a cheat. Meanwhile, other players wonder about the mark on his skin, and some recognize it as a curse from Lycagon, but wonder how he got it. A player called Orcelot mentions about Spawn killing him to get the info, and some players worry about Sunraku since Orcelot is the leader of a Shurikai clan, who are famous for player killers. A player named Saiger 100 thinks that so much info about Sunraku has been leaked, and decides to look out for him. She mentions in the forum that Sunraku should look for their clan members wearing emblems of wolf and sword, and they can help to protect him. Sunraku has got quite a popularity now, but he has no clue about it. Back in the present, Animalia is desperate to know how to tame a Vorpal bunny, and he wonders how that info got leaked. Just then a player attacks them, and tells him that he should not keep things to himself. Sunraku recognizes her as the Pencil Knight, but she tells him that in SLF she is known as Arthur Pensilgan. Sunraku notices that she has a level of 99, and she is a player killer. Sunraku mentions that she's his friend from a trash game, and we are then shown a trash game from the past called Unite Rounds. We see two players raiding an item shop, and they loot everything from the item shop. As they are walking away, Sunraku appears, and kills them. We learn that the game is known as a post-apocalyptic looting simulator among the players. The game was originally meant for saving a kingdom from monsters where the players would assume the role of knights, and it was a massive multiplayer online VR game. However, due to the garbage design and unreasonable drop rate, only few players played it. Even the beginner's quest for gathering herbs required over 12 hours to complete, so the players started stealing from others, and everyone became each other's enemy. To stop these rampages, a player decided to take control of the kingdom by sharing the wealth and drop items. The player's name was Pencil Knight, and the kingdom was then later named as Pencil Kingdom. She abused the players, and also used her agents to create a fake resistance group to oppose her, so that the players who became the victim would try to fight back, which prevented them from giving up on the game. We then see Sunraku with Katso, who are there to assassinate the Pencil Knight, but at this time she already has all the control over the game, and was known as Dystopian Empress. She appreciates Sunraku and Katso for managing to reach up to her, and gets ready for battle. 
We then cut back to the present where Sunraku recalls that their match ended in a draw with both of them dying in the end, and here in SLF they have a big gap in their level. Pensilgan attacks him, and mentions that she even took the penalty from the game to reach here, just so that she could play or kill him. Animalia is shocked to see her, as she realizes that Pensilgan is second in command of the Ashura Kai clan, who is also known as Giant Killer, for ambushing and killing high-level players. Sunraku teases her about being killed in the trash game, and she gets pissed. They engage in a fierce battle, while Amol is struggling to keep her human form. Pensilgan tells him that this time she has come here on her leader's request, and he will be their target until he reveals the unique scenario for taming the Vorpal Bunny. As they fight, Sunraku thinks that there's a big difference in their equipment and levels. He realizes that she stopped him just before entering the town, as it would be difficult for her to kill him in a highly populated area. Just then Amol transforms back to Rabbit, and Animalia is shocked to see this. Sunraku uses his repel counter move to push back Pensilgan, and asks Amol to jump onto him as he rushes towards the gate. Pensilgan chases him, and is about to catch up with him, but just then an explosion occurs, which was created by Animalia. She mentions that she doesn't care about Sunraku, but if Pensilgan tries to attack the rabbit she will kill her. Sunraku is glad that Animalia stopped her, and thinks that now he can enter the gate, but just then he sees four other player killers from the Ashura clan guarding the gate. Meanwhile, Animalia uses a special curse to attack Pensilgan, but she absorbs her attack and throws it back at her, which drops her HP to 7. Animalia is shocked that Pensilgan was able to repel her curse, and she tells her that she has a Carmen Straw doll which can counter all the curses. On the other hand, we see that all the four player killers try to attack Sunraku, and he wonders how he can cause damage to these high-level players. Just then, Ray appears and kills one of the player killers with one hit. The other player killers recognize her as the unparalleled attack master, and Sunraku wonders if she will cause more problems. We are then cut to Ray's past where she's having trouble finding Sunraku, and thinks that the games which he likes are all so hard for her. She could never find a game that she could play with him, but now that he's playing SLF, she can't miss this opportunity. She then receives an email from Sigur 100, who is her sister, and she wants her to find the player who has a Vorpal bunny with him. The player is expected to be in the city Thirdrima, and his player name is Sunraku. Ray then dashes at full speed to reach Sunraku, and thinks that she can't miss this opportunity. Back in the present, Pensilgan thinks that Sunraku has built his skill from trash games, and this is more valuable than the unique items and high-level stats in SLF. Furthermore, now that Katso has also joined SLF, her project seems to be possible. Just then, she sees Rei, whose player name is Saiger Zero in SLF, and she's surprised that Sunraku has managed to lure her as well, along with Animalia. She's happy that she came to meet Sunraku, but just then Animalia regains some strength, and prepares for a final attack. We then cut to a scene from the past, where Rei runs into a pole while stalking Rakuro. She thinks about how Rakuro is always smiling, and enjoying himself, which eventually made her fall for him. She tried to talk to him many times, but she wasn't brave enough. Back in the present, Saiger Zero saves Sunraku, but he thinks that Saiger Zero is also after the unique scenario. Meanwhile, Animalia uses her special skill, which is a suicide curse to destroy her opponent along with her, and manages to kill Pensilgan along with her. As the other players get distracted by her attack, Sunraku surprises Saiger Zero by climbing on her blade. He uses her as a trampoline to leap over other players, and apologizes to her while doing so. The other players try to stop him, but Saiger Zero attacks them, and Sunraku manages to enter the city. The other players see that Saiger Zero is acting weird, but she's just replaying Sunraku's apology in her head, and thinks that he finally talked to her. They try to attack her, but she's angry that due to them she wasn't able to talk to him more, and kills them all. Meanwhile, Sunraku is relieved that he finally made it to Rabatuza, and no one can follow him now. 
Emol didn't have enough magic to open the gate, but luckily he had magic potions to restore her power. Just then, he receives a message from Pensilgan, expressing her desire to have a meet-up with him and Katso in the trash game Unite Rounds to discuss something. Sunraku is a bit suspicious as she invited them to meet up outside of SLF, and just then he receives a message from Katso about the same. Katso plans to join the meeting, and Sunraku decides to join as well. After that, Emol takes him to a battle training field called Vorpal Coliseum. She mentions that her boss wants him to fight ten monsters only using Vorpal weapons, and he accepts the challenge. As the training begins, the first opponent is Packhound, and each of their average levels is about 65. Sunraku is shocked, and as the fight begins he is immediately defeated. Meanwhile, we see Rei, who is still fantasizing about the encounter with Sunraku. She thinks about sending him a friend request, and gets excited at the thought of him accepting her friend request. She then mentions that after the fight, she looked for him everywhere in Thirdrima, but couldn't find him anywhere, and wonders if he logged out. We then cut to Sunraku, who is fighting the packhound again, and this is his seventh try, but he's glad that the penalty for dying is off in this arena. He realizes that all of their attacks are well coordinated, so there must be a commander giving them orders. He notices that one of them always maintains a safe distance, and never attacks. Sunraku thinks that this must be the commander, and attacks it, which makes the coordination of the packhounds fall apart. He manages to kill the commander, and then easily defeats the others. After that, he hopes that the next opponent doesn't come in the group, and Emol mentions that it's a single opponent. As the door opens, his next opponent is Parasite Tentacle, and he is shocked to see a bear with many tentacles, as each head can be considered a separate monster. We then learn that he managed to figure out that the actual opponent was actually tentacles, so he used a hit and run strategy to defeat it on the fourth try. His third opponent was the Goblin Berserker which he defeated on his second try. Next was the Dino Boar who had abnormal stamina, but he was able to take it down on his first try due to his experience with trash games. The fifth opponent was Toxic Eagle which flew away and killed him using its dump which was poisonous, and it took him 112 tries to defeat it. After that, he went on to defeat Armored Larva on the first try, Execu Panther on the first try, and Twinhead Tiger on second try. His ninth opponent was a beta unit Golem S2, and after learning its attack patterns, he managed to defeat it in the seventh try. He's excited that he made it to the final opponent, but is sad that he went up only by two levels after all the fight due to the restrained collar. He prepares for the fight against his final opponent, but just then Vash shows up, and asks him to fight an opponent which he had caught for him. Vash knows that Sunraku can't defeat this monster in his current state, so he just needs to survive for five minutes to win this round. The monster's name is Aberrant Woodmage, and it immediately starts attacking Sunraku. He is surprised by its swift attacks, and thinks that it's going to be a long five minutes. We then learn that out of all the 30 million SLF players, Sunraku is the first one to encounter this monster, and its level is 120. Sunraku expertly evades its roots of death, and launches a counterattack. He managed to hit it, but it didn't do any damage. Sunraku realized that physical attacks didn't work, and he hoped to survive somehow. Emol cheered him on in the fight, and told him that he had to survive for four more minutes, while Vash was curious to see whether Sunraku would manage to survive the five minutes. Sunraku was constantly attacked by the Wood Mage, and it gave Sunraku a lot of trouble with its skills. The Wood Mage then attacked him with its chains, but Sunraku blocked the chains, and Emol was worried about him. The fight against the Wood Mage was intense, and Sunraku still couldn't create an opportunity to launch a counterattack. The Wood Mage almost managed to hit him, but Sunraku didn't give up. Suddenly, the Wood Mage cast an electric spell, and Sunraku was annoyed by his random skills, and he almost got burned. Then, Sunraku realized that the more time passed, the more Wood Mage mixed up the magic types. He wondered if he could manage to survive, 
and the wood mage's attacks were getting stronger and stronger. He knew that if it continued like this, he would die before the five minutes were up. The wood mage then activated a new spell, and Sunraku found it unfair that physical attacks didn't work. He continued to dodge its attacks, and couldn't believe that only two minutes had passed so far. Sunraku was starting to get tired, and was planning on giving up on the quest. Suddenly, he changed his mind about giving up, and wondered since when he became such a pushover. He remembered the fights he had before, and decided to survive at all costs and protect his honor as a trash game hunter. Sunraku started a counterattack, and charged towards the Wood Mage. Meanwhile, the Wood Mage attacked him with powerful spells, but he managed to get through the waves of attacks, and Amol was impressed. However, he was aiming at the monster's wand, which he used to nullify physical damage. The monster tried to retrieve his wand, but Sunraku stopped him, and planned to end the fight. Suddenly, the monster activated his skill, but Sunraku managed to steal his wand, and two minutes remained, while Vash wanted to see what Sunraku could do. The Wood Mage went berserk, launched powerful attacks, but he managed to avoid them, and Amol cheered him on, saying that he only had to survive for another minute. Then, a wall was created in front of him, and Sunraku was bound with iron chains. The Wood Mage wanted his wand back, and only 30 seconds remained. So, Sunraku threw his wand into the sky, and the Wood Mage went after to catch his wand. Sunraku mocked the Wood Mage for going after the wand, as this allowed him to survive for five minutes, but the monster still attacked him, and Sunraku ran for his life. Just then, Vash appeared, and crushed the Wood Mage. He was impressed by Sunraku's abilities, and Emol congratulated him on his victory. After that, Sunraku learned that he had passed the quest, and Vash declared him as honorary Rabatuzin. Sunraku wondered if he would still get a rare item, and Vash only removed the Vorpal Soul Collar. He was disappointed that he didn't get a special item, but the unique scenario was cleared. Suddenly, he was asked to start the bonus unique scenario, but he then logged out, and immediately fell asleep. The following day, Emol was taking care of a cactus, and Sunraku wasn't sure if he should start the bonus scenario. The recommended level for this scenario was level 80, so he decided to put it off for a while, and wanted to reach the next area first. Then he realized that he cannot leave Rabatuza without a disguise, otherwise, he will be hunted again. He couldn't hide Lycagon's mark, but Emol had a solution to the problem. Following this, she showed Sunraku a shop in the palace of Rabatuza, and introduced him to the shop owner Pete's, who was pleased to meet the famous birdman. Sunraku told it that it's just a mask, and took it off. Emol was shocked, as she thought he couldn't take it off. Pete's then showed him a very intriguing textile that she had recently received. Later, he bought a map, and the shopkeeper was shocked because Sunraku looked like a ghost. He was angry, and asked why he had to put on a meme costume. Emol tried to calm him down, and she drank many mana potions along the way to keep her human form. Then he activated the map, and looked at the different places. Sunraku didn't know which place to choose, and Emol suggested the fell fate caldera, but he decided to go to Prismatic Forest Grotto first. He starts giving her the reason for his choice, but she isn't listening, and mentions that they were being watched. We see that it's Saijur Zero, and Sunraku is shocked to see it. This is where the video ends, thanks for watching and see you in the next part.